Um, for those of you expecting uh, the last class of our Vipassana study, um, there's a bit of dukkha. You're going to be disappointed. Uh, with the holidays and the difficult schedule, I realize it would be uh, most skillful and incredibly wise. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, the last two classes of our Vipassana structured study will uh, be January 4th and January 7th. And then we'll start our uh, Truth of Happiness course that following Saturday, which would be the 11th. Uh, so there's a, there's a few really uh, interesting and fun suttas we'll get to. And one of them is today uh, from the Dhammapada. And Christmas Eve, we're going to have, I mentioned the two suttas on Rahula. Uh, the Dhammapada is a 26 uh, chapter volume in the fifth book of the Sutta Pitaka called the Kadaka Nikaya. Uh, and that the Kadaka Nikaya is uh, a set of 15 books with very short, mostly very short suttas or Dhamma teachings um, or other presentations of the Dhamma, such as the Dhammapada. The Dhammapada isn't a direct sutta from the Buddha. It's more of a compilation. But when you read the whole book, um, it's really remarkable in its scope. There's... Uh, and I think this summer we may do a, uh, I'm debating on one or another, we might go through the Dhammapada. There's a, there's a new um, translation by a, uh, a, a very gifted translator, not well known, uh, that'll be published later this year. And I was, <laughs> 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 and uh, I, 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 writing that book, I, I mean, it really is remarkable. And you'll see from this suit to today, how, how much is included and how, what, beautiful and direct uh, direction is in that little book that's everybody's kind of heard the Dhammapada but very few people actually read it because what's presented are these little snippets out of the Dhammapada usually misrepresented and that's taken as this great book uh, it's not there's so much in there um, this particular sutta the Pakita Kavaga um, is, again just a direct teaching on the Buddha's words on how important it is to keep a well-focused Dhamma practice and not get caught up in fabricated views and fabricated dharmas. Uh, let, me, let me read it. The Pakinkavaga. This is from the 21st chapter of the Dhammapada. The Buddha's words, it is by releasing the bond to lesser happiness that the wise develop the greater happiness. That's, that is one of the most instructive lines in all of the Dhamma because the Buddha is pointing out that grasping and clinging mind of an unawakened human being is stuck in these, in the constant choice between a greater and a lesser happiness, greed and aversion, isn't it? When we're recognizing, well, this is, I like this better than I like that. I like, I like chocolate better than I like vanilla. And you put yourself in that, in a, a conflict that doesn't even need to be there. Have chocolate when you have chocolate and have vanilla when you have vanilla. And if you don't like either one, you know, have a bowl of cherries. It's up to us and it's up to the way we treat our minds. And so the Buddha is saying, don't give up, don't lose your minds over a lesser happiness. We, we had a talk, and we talk about this in, in similar ways all the time. Lauren and I had a talk. It's really that choice. Do I want liberation or, or do I want a life of, of baubles, you know, meaningless things? Or do I want the one thing that I have control over, the most important and valuable thing any human being can ever develop, is understanding and a peaceful mind. That's what the Buddha is talking about. And it's foolish choices that keep us out of that greater happiness. The Buddha continues, the wise, understanding the greater, renounce the lesser. A clinging mind does not want to let go of anything, does it? Especially once it's associated with it or it's put some effort into acquiring something, including a set of beliefs that might be called a spiritual or so-called spiritual practice. The more effort that we put into something, no matter what it is, the less likely we are to let go of it simply because of that um, inherent clinging to it. We put our time in its mind. I've identified with it. I'm not going to let it go. I might add to it. I might try to combine this with that, but I'll never let it go because I'm always grasping after that that lesser happiness that I don't recognize is a lesser happiness. 
Those that are entangled by the bonds of hate, seeking happiness while hurting others, can never be released from hatred. Makes sense, doesn't just simple and direct. You can't live your life hating others or hating the world and practicing the most lofty spiritual practices and expect to get rid of hate. How could you? Because your focus isn't on letting go of hate, it's promoting it within yourself. The defilements only increase for the arrogant and mindless who avoid what is skillful and join with what is unskillful. The defilements cease for those with refined mindfulness who clearly understand Four Noble Truths, who practice jhana, abandon what is unskillful, and develop what is skillful. The wise Dhamma practitioner, having, having slain mother and father, don't get nervous, having slain mother and father, two warrior kings, a tiger, and conquered a country, they travel in peace, the explanation of that. Mother and father represent craving rooted in eye making. And if you think about mother and father give birth, it's craving that gives birth to a life of suffering rooted in ignorance. Mother and father represent craving rooted in eye making or conceit. The two warrior kings, kings represent extreme views ignorant of four noble things. Two warrior kings are always at loggerheads, are always fighting with each other. That's the internal struggle the Buddha is describing in that metaphor. A tiger represents the five hindrances. You can all identify with that, can't you? Wrestling with that tiger of our own hindrances. A country represents the six sense base. Everything resides in here. The wise Dhamma practitioner, having slain mother and father, two warrior kings, a tiger, and conquered a country, travel without regret. The wise Dhamma practitioner always happily awakens, there's a misprint there, it says awaken, always happily awakens, who constantly take refuge in the Buddha. The wise Dhamma practitioner always happily awakens, who constantly take refuge in the Dhamma. Buddha is referring to the, the triple refuge, the three jewels. The wise Dhamma practitioner always happily abandons, always happily awakens, who constantly take refuge in a well-focused Sangha. The wise Dhamma practitioner always happily awakens who constantly practice the four foundations of mindfulness. We do that every time we meditate and we integrate it into our Dhamma practice. The wise Dhamma practitioner always happily awakens who constantly delights in metta or loving kindness towards ourselves and others. The wise Dhamma practitioner always happily awakens who constantly practice jhana. How do we constantly practice jhana? The Buddha is not teaching us, or is he, that we need to meditate 24-7? Of course not. The, 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 the Buddha's teachings are the most practical teachings, and that's not a practical <clears throat> teaching, is it? To just meditate. We have, we're human beings. We have a human life. What the Buddha is teaching, and Laura mentioned it in this way a few times, is the seclusion we establish on our cushion, we take it off our cushion. And so that concentration, that jhana, is a constant part of who we are. And I think everyone in, and everyone in this room has talked about when they find themselves caught up in a fabrication reacting to the world, you remind yourself to come back to your breath. That's, that's continually establishing jhana in your life. So if there's a moment or an hour or 10 years where you've lost your mind, in the moment you can always take a breath and come back and you're practicing jhana. The life of the wise Dhamma practitioner is difficult <laughs> and hard to delight in. Would you all say that, that the, Dhamma, the, the life of a Dhamma practitioner is difficult and hard to delight in? Yeah. Would you say at times it is? Yes. <laughs> it is, isn't it? We struggle with, with things um, because of clinging to a lesser happiness that we don't recognize yet. I had a great conversation with someone yesterday about just that. And we come to the realization that, yes, this is something that this lesser happiness does not support the greater happiness that I know resides in front of me in, the, in a true refuge in the Dhamma, the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. The only way to get there is to let go of that lesser happiness. If we cling to it, it's always going to drag us back to that. The living death of ignorance is difficult and full of sorrow. So the Buddha gives us a choice. The life of the wise Dhamma practitioner is difficult and hard to delight in. The living death of ignorance is difficult and full of sorrow. That's where the, the idea, I think, that um, somehow the Buddha's Dhamma leads to this awakening where we're 
we're immortal and we live in the bliss of nothingness forever and ever. The, 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 what the Buddha means by the deathless state that he references in many suttas is just that. It's the, it's the death of ignorance. He likens living, living in a mind rooted in ignorance of Four Noble Truths as like a living death. And so the deathless state of awakening, what the Buddha is referring to, has nothing to do with you know, eternality or anything like that. It's, it just means that we're an awakened human being. Association with the unwise brings suffering. Wandering in confusion and delusion is suffering. Do not wander aimlessly, maintaining the distraction of suffering. Do not wander aimlessly. That's why the Buddha taught a direct path. That's what the path means. It keeps us focused on that direction. With conviction, the wise Dhamma practitioner is endowed with virtue, good repute, and knowledge. You can't say the same that with belief, the wise Dhamma practitioner is endowed, etc. There's no belief in the Buddha's teaching. There's nothing taken on faith. And there's a, there's a significant and complete difference between a faith-based study and a conviction-based study. And the best kind of analogy I can make is if I decide that I'm, I want to become a, a brain surgeon, the wise student is first going to look at a half a dozen or maybe 300 schools, and you're going to look for that school that seems to be teaching it in a way that you think you can gain the most benefit. And so you'll, you'll examine the curriculum as much as you can before you join, and then you'll write a check, and then you'll put yourself wholeheartedly in those classes. You're not saying, okay, I want to go, I want to be a brain surgeon, but I want to learn everything else there is in the world. You'll never get there, will you? because you're looking for all these lesser happinesses along the way. This might not be the most perfect analogy, but the point is that we look at our Dhamma practitioner, a, a wise Dhamma practitioner, not as faith-based. In other words, I'm not going to uh, Hardin-Simmons University. That's a whole lot of people even remember that reference. I used to have a great football team. I'm not going to Hardin-Simmons University to learn brain surgery because they have a great football team, but I, I have faith that they'll probably can teach me. I'm going to a school that I know will do what, I, and what I'm looking for. And so I enter it with conviction rather than faith. I know where I'm going. That's what the Buddha is talking about here. What's my spot? The wise Dhamma practitioner, with conviction, the wise Dhamma practitioner is endowed with virtue, good repute, and knowledge. They are always respected. The wise Dhamma practitioner shines from a great distance like the Himalaya mountains. Fools are not seen like an arrow at night. Fools are not seen, meaning we're not noticed. And we really don't, and the Buddha is talking also that not just that they're not seen in their life, they literally have no useful effect on the world. They're not seen, not, they're, not a, um, they're not a factor in human awakening, they're only a drag if they're not, right? That's what the Buddha is saying in a very broad way. Excuse me, sir. What does he mean by fool? Uh, again, somebody brought this up before. They don't like the word. In relation to the Dhamma, someone who is practicing something that they themselves say, well, this is Dhamma practice when it's not, is fooling themselves. That's what the Buddha is referring to. He's not saying human beings that don't practice the Dhamma are fools, but you are foolish if you think you're practicing the Dhamma and you're not. It's just the best word for it, isn't it? You're fooling yourself. The wise Dhamma practitioner having a step. The arrow at night is just uh, like a wasted effort. Yeah. yeah. It, 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 you're, again, the Buddha is saying basically that if you, can, if you live your life rooted in ignorance of four noble truths, it's a wasted life. It's a completely ineffective life. And again, we know that. You, know, you hear me say it often, and the Buddha does too. The most loving thing we can do for ourselves and all other sentient beings is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. That's what the Buddha is referring to here. If we really do, I mean, it's, it's, um, there's something that's been a part of modern Buddhism, modern spirituality, religion, all, all, forever. Um, but it, I notice it within Buddhism is this idea of engaged or socially engaged Buddhist practice or religious practice. And it's always against something. It, 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 and the, it's never done with a conviction establishing the Dhamma. In other words, if I really care about hunger, 
people starving to death or war or racism or interpolitical hatred, if I really do care about it, which most people do, but they don't know how to, how to resolve it, I will take to the Dhamma and awaken because at least at that point, I will stop contributing to all the ignorance in the world through rhetoric and, and my own hatred, my own antagonistic attitude towards something else that's already established in ignorance. It's foolish. To many, that's going to sound like you're doing nothing. But what you're doing is exactly what an awakened human being did. The Buddha was in a great position to help people at the age of 29. He was in a better position than almost everybody, anybody else on the planet. And he was full of compassion. But he left that foundation of power seeking understanding because he understood that the greater good was doing that first. He left a much lesser happiness, a prince in his father's kingdom, for the greater happiness of awakening and being, and now we know, being of true service to humanity. We're still talking about it today, aren't we? And it's still useful today. That's what the Buddha is talking about. That's what comes from abandoning the lesser happiness and developing the greater happiness. It's hard. It's hard to understand where my compassionate views are lacking true wisdom and where I may be causing harm in the world. Good examples of that are like the Christian Crusades and other things done in the name of religion. And most of them are, are sincere. They're just completely misguided. They're lacking wisdom. Another great, good example, and I'm going to get a bunch of emails on, on this, but I think of it often. Adolf Hitler, Pol Pot, for that matter, they thought they were doing what was best for themselves. They were so misguided and rude and ignorance. Look what happened from that but they were sincere in what they were doing. We all do that. We all are sincere in maintaining our ignorance. Most of us don't rise to the level of Pol Pot or Hitler. Most of us don't cause any type of huge egregious harm in the world, but we're not contributing to the greater happiness, are we? We are, we are, we, and we all know it. Every one of you has talked about the impact that your Dharma practice has had in your immediate circle. Is that right? That's a fair statement. Isn't it? Yes? yes? Don't shake. You can't shake your head. I can't see it. <laughs> Jump up and down and say, yeah. that's the greater happiness, isn't it? It's a greater happiness for me to actually know that I'm at least not contributing to the suffering that's already in, to the ignorance that's already in the world. It's more comforting for me to know that than to be recognized as a great philanthropist or something, because that's just fabricated, isn't it? The Dhamma practice heals the individual and through that, and it heals it in a, not in a, in a, not in a broken sense. <clears throat> the Dhamma develops a human being into full maturity so that they can truly be a presence in the world. That's, Buddha said that in the Sutta too, we're noticed from far away, not like someone who's rooted in ignorance like an arrow at night, you don't notice it. We, we notice it not so much because we're big and grand and everybody thinks we're wonderful. Everybody knows how wonderful we are. We're noticed because of who we are, simply who we are. We're a human being who's present and awakened in the world. I think that's, yeah, this point, if I may interrupt. It. Sure. I think that's what he means by the life is of the wise town practitioner is difficult. Yeah. Because here, Siddhartha, as a prince, has this lesser happiness already established. And it's difficult to leave that on the whim of the greater happiness, with no guarantees. And, there, and, and it's always like that, but it's real. I think, I mean, maybe I'm interpreting it wrong, and maybe it's lost in translation. But the living death of ignorance is difficult to pull the sorrow. You know, that your existence that you're living is uh, again established. And I, that's how I read it. Yeah. Through reading your explanation. Yeah, you're you're reading it clearly. It, it, again, the the there's nothing that terribly terribly remarkable about awakening as a human being, developing full human maturity, isn't it? You could say it's what we're supposed to do. We just don't know that. 
we don't understand what direction our lives should be taking because we're, that's the essence of distraction because we're so distracted after lesser happinesses, grasping after these things that we think we need when they're just the anchor keeping us rooted in ignorance. Michael. John, I'll just say, thank God you didn't come to Santa Fe with me to Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> because you would be false rates for lesser I don't know. It is a good point. <laughs> that's, a, that's an arguable point. <laughs> I wonder if somebody asked me when I was 15 years old, do you, do you want to be an old, bold meditation teacher in Fort Sandy? Do you want to play center field for the Yankees? I probably would have taken center field for the Yankees, but I'm, it's worked out pretty well, too, though, hasn't it? <laughs> okay, let me, let me keep going. The wise Dhamma practitioner, having established seclusion with right effort, Restrains, restrains themselves alone and delights in solitude. There were times in my life that if, if I was alone for more than five minutes, I was upset and I was usually, I would do something to distract me, usually you know, telephone or go out and hang out at a bar, or do something else, anything. And now I am so... Uh, appreciative of solitude, whether it's actual being alone with my dog or being in solitude in the world. Again, Lorna mentioned that just brilliantly a little while ago, that this, this seclusion that we establish on our cushion, we take it off our cushion into the world. That's what the, the meaning of not being entangled in the world. It doesn't mean we're not in the world. We're simply not entangled to it. We're not grasping after lesser happiness in the world. We're established in the greater happiness while we're walking gently through the world. Pretty good deal. I thought that was the end. I wasn't quite sure. That's the end of the chapter. A beautiful uh, sutta, isn't it? And it, there's so much um, encouraging direction in it. The Dhammapada is all like that. It's one chapter after another. And uh, when you read it from beginning to end, even the chapters are structured in such a way that it builds from kind of an introduction to the Dhamma, to the 26th chapter, which is a, a small chapter, but a, a complete description, much, much like the Anapanasati Sutta, but with different words, of what it means to be a Dhamma practitioner and awaken, like this one. Thank you. Um, let's go, um, the Thane and, uh, and Theater on, online, let's go to them first. See, Andrew, please tell Judy I said hello and Merry Christmas. Um, the Thane, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Yeah, it's nice to see you. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. Oh, anybody wondering? Uh, I used to call the Thane uh, Desun, but I don't anymore. Uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was wondering about just so everybody knows who who's this new guy. It's not. <laughs> it's <an old laughs> guy. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, this is um this is a a very um a very nice and uh, succinct um i'm sutta um and there's something that you said that um caused me a, a, a pause you you I, I remember you say that you know instead of you know doing um socially engaged buddhism um just as you know as you as you read here a man of conviction doubt with virtue and glory and wealth wherever he goes he is honored so um it seems like you know the practice itself shines um, and the the teaching the teaching can emanate from from the practice life itself, and I dig that. Um, it's interesting though, uh, knowing about uh, and if I'm not mistaken, um, the choices, for example, the Buddha makes can be rather revolutionary for his time. Um, and like, for example, bringing um, uh, bringing women into the order. You know, if I'm not mistaken, historically, women at the time was seen kind of suspiciously. And it should be a really a separation between the sexes if you want to yeah. achieve purity and so forth. But yeah. the Buddha um, brings women into the order and that it just goes to show. Also he brings, as you know, untouchables as yeah. well and breaks the caste system. Yeah. So, so I, I think I, for me, I, I, a, a nuance um, of the understanding uh, is uh, from a, a, an awakened, free, uh, unentangled mind, you can make skillful, virtuous choices. And it doesn't mean that you need to sequester yourself away, or that's a life of sequestering yourself away um, from the world, as you, as you can imagine. 
it is a good way. It, it is good at times to do that, as you know, uh, for for own personal uh, focus and and uh, practice. But um, from an awakened mind and the choices he makes, um, it can be um, uh, effects that are can be rebellious, uh, revolutionary, um, beneficial, and all the above. So uh, I, I, I kind of it's interesting for you to, to talk talk more about the um, the uh, the nuanced understanding of being awakened in the world, making choices that can be construed as rebellious or revolutionary when in fact they're just beneficial and quote unquote right. I don't know what's your what's your. Thank you. That that's just uh, just brilliant. The thing. Um, The, the Buddha, there, there's, there's paradox when viewing the Dhamma from the outside. You can't really understand the paradox until you practice. And the paradox is the idea of, of enraged, engaged Buddhism or social service, as opposed to this gentle awakening that results in an, in an awakened human being that is completely equal, I, I like the word equalitarian as opposed to egalitarian. They mean the same thing, but equalitarian makes the point. That is completely equalitarian. The Buddha was the most radical and provocative uh, thinker and teacher of his time, and he still is today, I think. When you, you actually apply what he teaches, it still contradicts everything that the world wants to continue, including, as far as we've come, this, this view of separation between people. In other words, the, the, an awakened human being has resolved the issue of hatred and misogyny and racism within its own mind. So it's not an, even an issue within that community that the Buddha established, was it? <clears throat> he couldn't see it. There was, it wasn't even a choice for him. I mean, he had to consider the safety of women when he first let them into the Sangha, but it wasn't a look at, well, women are different people or these undesirables that are still around, by the way, in India, there's still a class that's looked at that way, remarkably so, are just human beings. Everyone he saw, he saw it from the view of, a, of the Datu Vibhanga Sutta. Every human being is made up of four properties, the sixth property of space, and the, uh, the fifth property of space, and the sixth property of thinking consciousness. Nothing else. And when you really understand that, you can't see black, white, green, women, men, different political parties, somebody's better, somebody's, you just can't do it. It's not possible mm -hmm. from that mind. So the, the issues that we struggle with and have been struggling with forever are not resolved from a direct attack on, I got to solve racism or I have to solve poverty. That's my life's work. If my life's work is what the Buddha did, if I awaken first and I develop within me an equalitarian view, all those issues are resolved. And there's proof that it's the only way that it's going to work. What's the proof? Look at the prevalence of ignorance in the world today. Things have gotten better. And, and I'll use our country as an example, as far as racism and maybe poverty, but only on a surface level. There's no more institutionalized racism that's obvious. But there's still very, very subtle aspects of it, isn't it? And that's because government can't resolve issues in people's minds. The very, very subtle aspects that are remnants of racism in this country and in the world are because of the way people think, obviously. But we can't legislate thinking. And that's why it's still here. And it's, it's always going to, and, and I'm using racism because it's such a, a big issue today, but pick an issue. It's all rooted in ignorance. And the reason why we can't resolve it is because we see, look at, look at the political, I don't want to get too deep into it, but politics today is all identity politics. Mm -hmm. We're, we're separating people in the most narrow way possible. Mm -hmm. We're getting more, um, more prejudiced, mm -hmm. more racist, more hatred, as we attempt to put a focus on specific issues and say, well, look at that. We have to solve that first. Um, somebody talked about yesterday, again, I don't, let's not get into a political debate, but this just makes the point that I heard yesterday. Somebody running for president said that, that they would have one day a year of a, as a special day of mourning for transgender people that got murdered in the past year. Sounds like a great idea on the surface, doesn't it? But what about all the other people that got murdered? Don't they rage? 
And what happens when we have transgender murder day? What about when I'm thinking about my brother that got murdered last week or my friends that just got murdered in Philly over the weekend? How, how is that? How is that? It, it sounds helpful. It sounds like a great idea to this person. And it, to me, that's the cruelest thing you can do. And you're also separating out even more transgender people by giving them a special day. A, a, a wise move might be, well, let's have a, a, a national day of mourning. Yet we have one, it's called Memorial Day. Mm -hmm. And it's focused on the uh, veterans, but it really, we do include everyone into that, don't we? But in grasping after something else to make me notice, we bring in even more hatred into that little narrow view. So, boy, that was a long answer, but you inspired something to think. Thank you. Is it helpful? Uh, um, yes, yes, it was helpful. And and you, you, the last thing I want to kind of touch on is that you you talk about, um, uh, well, or should I say, um, how can you change people's minds? And that's that for me. That that has always been kind of the the guiding principle of what the Buddha did where, you know, he wasn't an evangelist. Um, he, he says, you know, he walked, he walked, you know, he, how, how you say, he walked the talk and people saw it and began to follow him. So I suppose that, that um, like-minded people, because that was the question, you know, well, all this, you know, racism and, and classism and so forth, you know, you're right to, to go around and try to rattle people's minds, especially when it comes to religion. I mean, even my own mother, um, you know, for me to, you know, tell her, you know, hey, why don't you, uh, actually, um, she is getting receptive to meditation. <laughs> it's interesting in of itself. But besides that, um, which is, which is great, which is wonderful. Yeah. But, but to, 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 discuss, to, to have people change their, to force people or try to, uh, convince people to change their minds. I, I, I really, um, I don't know if, if dialogue is, is the, is, is one way that one can do it um which is a good way to do it but um i i, I think as uh you know the, to live the practice and find like-minded people and for the sangha to, to be the light in the yeah. midst of of the uh of, of what's going on and to see the really for us to see be the stark contrast i think it's the best the oh, best yeah. thing we can do i don't know that this is the I'm, I'm not sure this is what's coming up for me i don't know john what's what's your before we... <laughs> yes i i agree completely i mean again the, these folks have heard me say that over the most loving thing I can do for myself and all other human beings is to take to the Dhamma and awaken. Mm -hmm. And the, the, I think Siddhartha Gautam approved it and we're proving it ourselves. Teaching we are simply more peaceful. Pardon me? And teaching by example. And yeah, teaching and living by example. Mm -hmm. You know, again, we, we, we've been trying forever to legislate against things that, against dukkha, literally. And the Buddha said, wait a minute, you can't, you can't change this. This is an aspect of having a human life. Mm -hmm. including the things we just talked about. It's just that way. The Buddha, was, the Buddha taught radical acceptance, and he said to abandon any type of need to approve. That's going after the lesser happiness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. and, and so we're, we're, we're at this point, again, we're talking with Lorna, there's nothing in a human being's life that, is, that doesn't fit or is addressed within the Buddha's dominant. There's not one thing that I've found yet that, if it was an issue, a problem, that is not directly addressed by what this brilliant man taught 2,600 years ago. And that's, that is remarkable until you think that the problem, the underlying problem isn't that we can't get to Mars fast enough. The underlying problem is ignorance. It still is. Ignorance of four noble truths, which means truths that are, that are lasting. They're, they're truths no matter what situation. And, and so the, the truth that we might cling to that's not part of Four Noble Truths is simply a lesser happiness. Michael. Um, you, don't, you don't change anyone's minds. People change their own minds. Yep. But what we can do is we can be an example of what ignorance is not to anyone yep. and everyone. And that's why we're here, is to, is to uh, uh, come to terms with our own ignorance and one day be free of stress and ignorance. Yeah. So that's my view on that. There's yeah. no way of everyone has free will to make decisions. Yeah, and if we 
Yeah. And if we do that, then we are an example to other people. And that, that's going to change. And it's not to say that we, again, we, I've said it before, we've made great changes in this country and in many places, South Africa and what Nelson Mandela did is remarkable. But there's still a lot of racism, racism in South Africa. It didn't solve the problem. It did lessen it. It put a spotlight on it. But it, none of it's going to be resolved until one way or another people come to understand four noble truths, whether it's through the Dhamma, which I think is the easiest and direct way, or maybe some other way. I don't know. But, uh, if, again, thank you, Dethane, for bringing that subject up. And it fit right into what we're talking. You know, what, are we gonna, are we going to practice an authentic Dhamma and then have that real effect on ourselves first, and then as a consequence of that in the rest of the world? That's the question. So thank you. Thad, good to see you this morning. Glad you joined us. How are you? Oh, do you need me to unmute your mic? There you are. Oh. Can you hear yeah. me? There you are, Thad. How are you? Oh, I, I'm fine. Thank you, John. This is a very, very uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, talk and, and conversation you have here. To, this thing about, you know, so, being socially engaged and contrasting with the seclusion, uh, the, the strengths I get from, uh, from my meditation practice over the years is that uh, uh, it gives me the, uh, you know, the ability to have some discernment. Mm -hmm. Uh, to know what's the difference between the lesser happiness and the greater happiness. Because usually with me, I'm like a bull in a china closet and I'm responding to my uh, uh, aversion or, or greed and I'm just reacting immediately with my meditation practice. It's allowed me at least to have a little bit of space, mm -hmm. a little bit of discernment in my life. And that's a personal thing that, that that's the strength of Dharma practice. Is it, that that's quite a gift to have instead of always constantly immediately reacting to stimuli and making all kinds of you know uh, egregious mistakes sometimes and when, I, I, I catch myself all the time making assumptions about a situation and then just a few minutes later realizing that I've been completely mistaken about my assumptions and is that uh, it's it's uh, John uh, meditation it allows me to have that little tiny space for that discernment to start working. Yeah. So this is a very, 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 very good, uh, very good talk this morning. I needed. Yeah, I did too. Thank you, Pat. Be beautiful words. Um, it is just that the, the, um, the seclusion isn't turning our back on worldly problems. It's doing what we need to do so that we can actually address what's going on in the world in a meaningful and mindful way. It's, years and years ago, I read a uh, biography, not an autobiography of Mother Teresa. I think everybody knows who that was, called her the Saint of India. And my impression, I think like most people was that this woman, it was 24 seven, she was out there just working herself to death to take care of people. When the truth of it was in her, in her own brilliance, what she did is for six hours every day, her and her nuns that she was in charge of spent in prayer and meditation so that they could go out and serve the world that way, the way that they did. They took care of their own so-called spiritual needs first before they went for service to others. The Buddha did the same thing, by the way. He awakened first before he tried to do anything. And then he, you know, you know, it is remarkable. So thank you. Jen, good morning. Good morning. Um, so, I, <clears throat> with something this week and, and I it relates to what we're talking about it was it was you know phenomena in the in the world and I came in contact with it and I didn't and I started to resist it and I started to think and react and and I brought in the four foundations of mindfulness and I saw myself mentally searching for a thought that would make me feel better. And I realized that that was, <laughs> you know, clinging to sensory fulfillment. And I abandoned it. And 
I created the space for peace in that moment. Yeah, you did. Um, and it just, it was helpful because I, then I continued to after the week, and even though I, I continued to come up against that phenomena, I was able to move through it and be skillful. Um, and it just kind of, when you guys were talking about, uh, being skillful in the world and, and kind of doing <clears throat> work that is with, with other humans that also have egos. Um, the difficulty is that you could either be both operating from an ego place, but even if the other person is not part of the Sangha or any Sangha. If you can drop your own defense system, your own reaction, and just be with whatever's coming up for you, the other person's going to recognize that. And yep. they're going to see that you're doing that. Even if you just are letting them know that you're frustrated with the situation, as soon as you recognize that you are frustrated because of you, they, it gives them the space <clears throat> and the opportunity to recognize that they are frustrated because of them. That's right. <laughs> and then it's- it, it, then It's the beginning of peace, isn't it? Right, and mm -hmm. then everybody is on the same page. Yeah. And you can but navigate the stress together, <clears throat> which is gonna be more valuable than you know, me trying to navigate it and you trying to navigate it. Would you join forces in terms of whatever it is we're trying to address? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, so it, it sounds, it sounds right. yeah. Of ignorance. yeah, right, right. It sounds so simplistic, but, it's so but if, if two people can actually do that, recognize the ignorance in each other, right. imagine if, if two world leaders were able to do that, or three or four or five. It probably wouldn't take more than two or three to actually practice that and say, you know, the problems that you've had with me is because of me. And the problems I've had with you are because of me. It's the same thing. So let's deal with our own stuff. Let's let go of all the, all the need to be bigger, better, all the need for me as a powerful country to look at even greater happiness by some other nefarious means. And just calm down and be who we are. And you in said the, the word. And in that moment, they're creating this space. I love that line that you said, for peace to prevail. A calm, that's what the Buddha taught. We clear out the junk in our own heads so that there's space for a calm and peaceful mind. It is. And what is trash? Trash is a fabrication. And the fabrication resolves within each human being, not through legislation, not through telling people you should be this and you should be that. The Buddha, re again, realized the cruelty of that. Wake up, you know, if you do it. Thank you, Jen. Mm -hmm. Beautiful. Good morning, Lorna. <coughs> uh, this sutra is the sutra that I needed to be um, go through in a class because I read it at home. I really <coughs> got very much out of it from reading it at home, but coming to class and hearing John's input and explanations um, has been very helpful. And like Tim, I, I hadn't associated the Buddha having all the wealth and the um, immediate eye making that goes with that and <clears throat> abandoning it and for the greater good of the bigger vision. Yeah. I hadn't seen the contrast of that, what, it, what he actually does, did in his life. And you can relate it to living in a castle and living with nothing, yeah. nothing, nothing but a blanket or something. Um, yeah, uh, it's very good. I think it was uh, yeah. made a change. It's kind of a change to look at something, you know, in bits and bobs, and rather yeah. than just one continuous suitor, you it made a change. Yeah, 
I did too. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, you think about the, the Buddha when he left his palace, he was frustrated. We know from a, a recounting of the Buddha uh, when he was five years old, how frustrated he was as a five-year-old living in this incredible luxury. And so when he left and he first saw how people really lived, that's what convinced him that being a king or a prince is not good enough because he left the palace, walked into the local town, if you will, and saw sickness, aging, and death which he never saw before. And so he had to come to the realization that with all my wealth, just down the road, human beings are living like this. So what good is it? I mean, it's just a, a practical way that this man looked at life. All the wealth I have in my family, people are still suffering. So that's not the answer, is it? And he left at that moment to figure it out. And he did for all of us. Thank you. Morning, Ron. Good morning. But uh, being in the world and and as a as a practitioner, um, it does make a difference. Uh, just yesterday, I had a I had a great situation at work. Uh, something in the fireplace, and uh, everything was fine. Uh, the next day, the man's back in the store, and he's yelling and screaming that his house is full of soot. My boss gets his hackles up and he says, no, no, we didn't do that. You did something stupid. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, customers not always right with him. He calls me and says, hey, Rob, you got to do something about this. Okay. And once I got over my own, like, two okay. seconds of, oh, I don't really want to do this, you know, I got nothing. Um, I go back there and I, I, I said, you know, let's, let's get you out of this. Let's just get you out of this. Let's just you know, go there and look. We just want to, we just want to see what's going on because then maybe you know we just have his word of what's going on and yeah. we have my word of what, what is there. Um, let's just go see what's going on before we get antagonistic about this you know, because we have lowered the problem of insurance and we have lawsuits and this and that and the other thing. Let's just go there and see. Let the man talk. Let him show what's going on, and then we'll see and, and find out what happened. And sure enough, we get in there and we find some strange thing that had happened out of everybody's control. Yeah. And and stood back and said, "I apologize for going off on you." Mm -hmm. And we walked out. Everything was great. <clears throat> but it's it's the effort of of, of getting. Getting your ego and getting your, yeah. your your own clinging stuff out of there, and situations just resolve yeah. without having to uh, even put a lot of effort in. Or or eventually signing assigning blame. <laughs> yeah, assigning blame. Well, that this was the first thing that, that came up. Like who who we're going to blame for? Yeah. Which is completely irrelevant in the moment, you. unless you're <laughs> insurance company. But yeah. yeah. But, you know, we all have been, like, still a, a massive software. Yeah. You know, in that way. Yeah. And it's wonderful to, to uh, I, you know, and I've been talking uh, about teaching for quite a long time with him. Uh, and uh, when he came back, he was like, oh, this stuff is still wrong. <laughs> Thank you for, for pointing this out, that this, this is how it works. Yeah, a little, like, this, this is... A nod to the thing, a little bit of conscious commerce there. Yeah, and then you know the, the good news there is that he came from from the corporate world, you know, where everything is blame and, and, and yeah. antagonism, and whatever. Yeah, it's a, and, and he uh, and he didn't like that anymore, and he actually went into retail business to to um, to be more people oriented and, and you know have a have a more peaceful life. You want to do that in retail, eh? Well, <laughs> it's being more directly related to people. Yeah, no, I'm just Instead kidding. of, you know, accounts and this and that, you know, and just running numbers. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and that's, I was making a joke, but that's true in Gates Buddhism, isn't it? At, yeah. In commerce, exactly. in the world. That's, I mean, that's where it needs it. It's not, it doesn't, the world doesn't need uh, Buddhism in temples and on people's 
cushions down in the basement. The world needs Buddhism out in the world. Right. And even and, in the Buddhist time, it was practiced yeah. by, you know, by the chariot maker. Or Everyone. The world. There was, you, you joined the Buddhist song, you left the world behind, but you didn't leave the world behind. You were, you were expected to learn the Dhamma and go out and teach it if you wanted to eat. Right. And, and that's, how the, that's how it spread. So uh, coming in the new year, I expect all of you to start you know, going around town. We're going to wear a uniform. <laughs> 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 We're gonna, I, I thought of a name too. I don't want to use like Buddhism because it puts up Johnny's Witnesses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Never leave until you get a <laughs> commitment. Good morning, Tim. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I think early on in, in following the Dhamma, I realized that the core within dependent origination was the self, was the ego. All the problems were that the problems describing, I've been there too. And I've also been in situations where you had right view, right effort, everything, but the person's ego was so entrenched that mm -hmm. they didn't care. Yeah. Right. Yeah, and that would have been the possibility. And, 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 and that does happen sometimes. And, and, and to John's point of leaders getting together, that's all great. If, but if not, if all people are willing to. You know, unveil that ego, it, it could be a problem. The, um, and I think it's not, I think it's something we all struggle with, not only on, on the basis with, with talking with other human beings, but also within ourselves. I know that's certainly with me. Uh, this is a, a study of a personal study, uh, uh, first off and foremost. So, um, yeah, I want to, I want to. Clarify if you, or if you can clarify this paragraph that's really grabbing me. The one that Anthea mentioned and I mentioned the life of the wise practitioner. Is he stating is, is a sangha? Are they the practitioners, not necessarily wise or otherwise, but are people practicing the Dhamma the practitioners? Correct, yes, okay. So it's us, so it's us. So, um, in that. Then, you know, I can relate to this very much so because the difficulty and the delight is hard to get initially, I think. I haven't achieved that yet, obviously. Um, but the result of the ignorance is difficult to pull sorrow. We, we can, we can, we can, we can, we can see that analytically but yet that we torture ourselves and continue to do it mm -hmm. continue to do mm -hmm. it and wandering in confusion and delusion and suffering yep. that's the wandering part do not wander aimlessly maintaining the distraction of suffering um that's a powerful paragraph for me right now and maybe yep. you could just maybe i'm i want to i want to make sure i'm interpreting the well, yeah, the, the, the word that's often used for um, in, in throughout all the different Buddhist traditions for the suffering of human life or the inherent suffering of human life is samsara. And that simply translates to uh, wandering around in, in suffering or wandering in ignorance. Mm -hmm. And that's what the Buddha is referring to. Okay. Is, is, and the, the, the uh, reference to it, wise Dharma practitioner is my translation. Um, and I think those of you that have read my uh, my rewriting of a lot of it. One is that there's very, very little reference to Dhamma practitioners other than monks, meaning nuns or being generic. When I know for a fact, eh, I know for a near certainty that there must have been nuns present, but they're just written that way. And so the phrase was probably the accomplished monk, et cetera, et cetera. It just, it's just more accurate, I think, to say the wise Dhamma practitioner. And the point is, there's Dhamma practitioners that might be practicing a little bit of the Eightfold Path and a little bit of, of chanting and a little bit of ritual and a little bit of this. Those are practitioners. And then there's the wise Dhamma practitioner that practices what the Buddha taught. That's the reference here. Thank you for the great question. Anthony, good to see you. Good morning. Uh, it was a really great suit. Uh, I... I would not have understood it without your interpretation because there was so much metaphor built into that. Yeah. It's like mother and child meaning 
mm-hmm. and agreed in a version. I would have that, that's a, that's a, a lot of it. So thanks for illuminating that for, for me and for us. Um, and also on the issue of the social justice, I kind of was thinking being a child of the 70s, I remember Billy Jack. And, yeah. and he was I'm this watch guy that. who was the, he was part Indian, but part white American. And he would always be, he was just, he would engage with that part of his Indian culture. And then issues would come up where people would start to act in a prejudiced way and they would yeah. fondle the Indian women and torture the men. And he would always come up and just say, let them go. And sometimes it worked. And then sometimes he would, there would be a stand down and he would have to defend. Yeah. But that is the Buddhist way. Like don't, you know, Greenpeace would go out and attack the white community. He just, he just accepted things as they were unrolled, tried to extricate himself from an issue. And when he couldn't, he did what was needed to protect himself in the Indian community. And I was like, well, that's, that's kind of the way it is. And I remember when I started, we had certain people, I'm not going to name any names, but they wanted you to go in the direction of being a social justice group and go out and do things. And you would always say, no, we're just here to understand the teachings of the Buddha and become enlightened. Yeah, thank you. And I'm glad we didn't go in that direction. Well, I am too. And those, and it's unfortunate, but that was, it was just a good example of people grasping after the lesser happiness of fulfilling this ideology that they had, you know, and it, it, it's just, it's just another, because it falls on the, the good side of things. We want to say, oh yeah, well, that's, he just should be that way. But we, a, a wise person understands the deeper motivation between those yeah. kind of things and, and you just realize the foolishness of it it's the, it's the right word um, the other thing we have to get past and this is one of those real subtle things um, if you look out on the world today especially United States and the difficulty in the politics and all this the, the real polarizing problem is that both sides, and, and I, this is equal, there's the equalitarian ignorance on both sides, not one, is, one isn't better than the other anymore today, uh, if it ever was, is that they have, they both are so entrenched in the Messiah complex. They are, and, and I'm, I'm surprised that some, you know, like Dr. Joyce Brothers, if she's still around, got up and said, hey, you know, this is the problem, because it's so obvious to me. They, they, everybody thinks they're the savior, and, and and they're the good ones. And when you take on that mentality, if you're the ones that are right, then everybody else is evil. And then you can, you can, what's the, what's the word that we use now today that we cancel people out because they're evil. We don't even have to consider them anymore. We don't have to think of their views, what, whether, what their position is. I'm the savior of the world. This is my group. We're all saviors. And if you don't agree with me at all, you're, you're a racist, you're this, you're that. Mm-hmm and you're pure evil. And when you're pure evil, then you, we don't need to do anything with you. Look at the problem. And of course, that's not. It's just human beings trying to live in the world. So. Yeah. The last point I wanted to make is I also related to that portion where they talk about uh, it being content uh, with solitude. Because I was like you. I, was, I could never be alone. It just never felt comfortable for me. And after I started the teachings, now I actually... Um, enjoy it but in, and then take it to the next level which isn't good at all i crave it <laughs> <laughs> thank you anthony it's interesting it's it better to crave silence than to reject it I think. yeah i would say i i there's days when i crave getting back to my cushion <laughs> um this this it's to go a little bit further on this it's interesting that's coming up a few days before christmas that this idea of i use a broad example of the messiah complex but the idea of engaged Buddhism or engaged any social engagement is rooted in a messiah complex, isn't it? That I know how to solve this. I know how to heal something out there. And the intention is almost always sincere. There's usually some grasping, looking after recognition, but it's the results that matter. And taking a view, I, I've yet to look at any, and I look at these kind of things closely, maybe, maybe too closely for a normal human being, but I've yet to come across a cause that, that wasn't antagonistic towards something, even though they might be saying we're trying to be conciliatory and this and that. It's always against something, and that always creates a tension. It's always hurtful. You know? yeah. Nick, good to see you.
Glad you're here. Trevor, good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you for your teaching today. Thank you for being here. I was wondering if you could help me uh, put your last, your last talk together with this one. If That's in like, the past. I, don't <laughs> <laughs> I hope I can. One thing you said, so I'm kind of interested, maybe it's kind of a paradox, but um, kind of duality versus non-duality. The last, yep. last class we are talking about disenchantment, dispassion, there's nothing good or bad yep. in the world. Oh, that there is something good. There is something to strive for, aim for. So it doesn't seem to have that same disenchantment, unless we're kind of limiting that non-duality to things of the world. Yes. So I'm curious how you put those two things together. It's a great question. It shows some penetrating insight. There, um, I made the statement that I don't see any good in the world anymore, and I don't see any bad. That's a that's a mind resting in equanimity. The, and that's in the world, that's in the fabricated world. The Dhamma is what allows me to live that way. So it's not, there's not a paradox there. I'm not grasping after something that is real and tangible in the world. This is within me that I'm developing this. It has, in fact, it has nothing to do with the conditions of the world, good or bad, doesn't matter. I have regained control of my mind and I know how to maintain this refined mindfulness of a mind united in its body. Does that answer your so question? Is there something then, would you go as far as to say there's something good in your human nature? Um, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it that way because uh, there's some subtle aspects of looking at things like my inner nature that is really just rooted in speculation too. Mm -hmm. In grasping, I don't know. I mean, a lot of most of the schools of modern Buddhism say that the ultimate goal is realizing Buddha nature or Buddhahood. The Buddha never mentioned any of those things once, and it implies some kind of permanence in a fabricated view. The Buddha said a human being is made up of these six properties. They didn't say there's anything inner or outer. It's just this. And when we start speculating about some other type of me, we're lost. So there's no good inside me. But guess what? There's no bad either. There's nothing broken. There's nothing I have to fix. There's nothing I have to add to, to be a human being. In fact, there's nothing I can do to change the fact that I am made up of six properties and that's it. No matter what I achieve, no matter what I don't achieve, no matter what happens to me, no matter what pain I might have, no matter what skin color I might have, no matter what might befall me because of this difficult world we live in, none of it changes who I am. It can't. And in that understanding, in that profound understanding, is peace of mind. So there, there is no good or bad in the world, but there is a lesser happiness when I cling to the things of the world. The greater happiness is letting go of that clinging. That's the basis of the whole Dhamma, craving for and clinging to fabricated views of self. Does that bring some clarity? That helps, yeah. I think I'm still trying to chew on that a little bit because there's no Yes, in reality. Again, remember the, how we're looking at this. And you're, you're, I can tell you're really grasping the Dhamma because of your questions. You're, you're, you're struggling with the idea of, and it's the basic struggle that, that many people have, is what happens when I let go of all these self-referential views? Where is the me in the world then? Because that when, in, in essence, what you're saying is the good in the world is the me in the world. But the good in the world that is the me in the world, if it's fabricated, is also the bad in the world. Again, maybe not you directly, but it is that, that um, ambiguity between that that creates all the stress and suffering. An awakened human being still lives in the world. All the things still occur. It's still, I'm not going to say it's still, it is now a real human being. He was no longer affected by the things of the world. So there's no, what I mean is there's no good in the world. There's nothing for me to grasp after to make myself happier or more secure. But there's also nothing in the world that I need to avoid 
to keep myself happy or maintain my happiness. Why? Because I understand I can't. Things are going to happen to me. I'm going to continue to get old or older, believe it or not. It's still possible. <laughs> Other things are going to happen to me, but they're not good or bad. They're simply a consequence of having a human life. The Buddha said uh, the first noble truth is dukkha occurs. Birth is dukkha. Sickness is dukkha. Aging is dukkha. Stre uh, death is dukkha. Not getting what is desired is dukkha or suffering. Getting what is undesired is dukkha. In short, the five clinging aggregates are suffering. That's describing the good and the bad in the world, isn't it? It's all dukkha. When we remove ourselves from that craving for and clinging to the things of the world, we're still in the world. The things that are pleasant, the beautiful sunsets and the smell of a, of a newborn baby's head, I always go back to that. They're still there in the world and they're there for us to be mindfully present with what's occurring in a way that was never possible before. I can I appreciate the, a, a simple sunset more than I ever have. Why? Because now I'm 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 actually present for it, and I don't have to. I don't have to. You've heard my story about the the green flash. I won't get into the whole thing, but I don't have to compare. This was a really good sunset, but last night was much better. Or I hope tomorrow is a better. It's just it's just here's a sunset. Here's a dog. Here's a dharma class. You know whatever it is, and my mind is the same no matter what. Isn't that remarkable? And so again, I hope I'm bringing a little clarity to that. But that's where you're heading, Trevor. Yes, of course. Just to kind of also pull together what you were saying, relating last class to this class. So you want to develop this passion with making me happy. Everyone. Happy holidays, Nick. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Happy holidays. Nice seeing you. You want to de develop the ability to let go of the idea of making me happy because that's a lesser happiness yes looking for the for the, for the making me happy so mm -hmm. if it's something that you're defining in aspect to this to this me then that is a lesser happiness yeah so, yeah, so you could you could or we can we can define happiness within the dhamma structure as to awaken and it's important to notice that because Prior to that, we have all can, kind of, can, excuse me, all kind of conditions on our happiness. That's what a conditioned mind means. I'm only happy if this and that occur. You know? An awakened human being has that great spaciousness in their own minds because they don't. It's not a consideration anymore. This is what life is. Thank you, Trevor. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Becky, good to see you. Thank you, John. Nice to be here. Always, always great to be here. Um, I just want to say a couple things about what we're talking about here. Um, <clears throat> it's that it's that letting all of letting go and and not putting conditions on on what's happening to you in the world what happens when you when you actually when that happens a couple of times when you actually are in the space that we're trying to get into you you actually feel that you've been able to let go. You know it. You know it. Yeah. And you only, yeah, you somehow get there through this practice by by following the, the Eightfold Path. Right effort is extremely important. Yeah. You somehow get there and you know and you just are able to look to be in the world without taking any, without taking it personally. Yep, not a thing. Without having this. But for me, I only can talk about that because of a couple of brief moments. And I have, <clears throat> I, tr I try to be very kind to myself, but there are, 
most of the time I'm I'm still doing walking through the world the way I I used I've always walked through the world and it's 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 just you just have to keep practicing yeah. and hopefully uh, you will have a few of those I had one of those this week and um, and when and it's so such a lovely way to be and live. I mean, such <laughs> such a calm. It's just the way it should be. Yeah, it is. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's the way it should be because it's it is reality. It is. You know, it's, it's, you're so there. Yeah, reality should be reality. You're there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and it, it, you, it's remarkable, you, Be Becky, that you understand you it. You don't give yourself enough credit for how much. Maybe, yeah, I don't know. You don't. <laughs> but you can start to realize it when when you when you feel yourself being really like unhappy. Something is. I'm really. I really feel really awful right now. And if you just then, if you just take a deep breath and you have that space you can start to realize the story you're telling yourself. Yeah. This is not me, this is not mine. And I'm putting myself here. I'm putting myself yeah. here. Yeah. And then you can use the practice and yeah. get along with your day and it's a much better day. <laughs> if, if, if I'm in distress, it's because of me. Yes. Always. Thank you. Um, I got to ask you to be quick, Mike, because I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. it all falls on Michael. Sorry. Everybody sorry. else, you talk too long, but Michael's got to. <laughs> Matt's got a class to teach him. But we got some time. Okay. I think we have to realize when we're fabricating, okay? And it's a good idea. We don't we have, have to. to realize when we're fabricating. And that happens basically un almost unconsciously. We don't even recognize what we're doing by it. We're fabricating all the time. Yeah. Yeah about anything that occurs we're fabricating uh, and the thing there to do is to like catch catch yourself when you're fabricating and again it happens most of the time if when you do this if you if, then when you see that you're fabricating okay and uh, fabricate fabrication comes from like you being in you're uh, actually you're being uh, entangled in the world it's you yep. it's it's this eye making that uh, is is causing these fabrications. Uh, once we recognize that, like this is not me, this is not uh, not mine, this is not who I am, then we we see, you know, whatever is seen is only seen, whatever is heard is only heard, whatever is uh, sensed is only sensed, and uh, whatever is uh, uh, cog cognized is only cognized. So once we once we separate ourselves uh, understand that this is this is not again who i am all right once we we can understand that and that the fabrications once you understand that then the fabrications don't exist yeah. when you take the you out of it the fabrications don't exist okay so when fabrications don't exist then where are we we're left with the eightfold uh, path and the Eightfold Path, is, as life unfolds and it occurs, then we handle things without fabrications interwoven in our, in our thinking process. So we handle them from right view, right effort, uh, right intention, <clears throat> all, the whole Eightfold Path. Where does that lead us? That leads us in a peaceful and abiding. If we're like with an integrated uh, Eightfold Path, that's where we're going to be left, in a peaceful, yeah. Abiding, calm, that we're, and you know, towards a liberation of. Yeah. <laughs> it's a it. beautiful <laughs> Dharma teaching. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, it was remarkable. Um, we we do we do gotta we do gotta finish up. We do have to finish up class. We do have to finish up class. Matt needs to get in here. So. Um, yeah, we'll finish with Meta as we always do. We we uh, we're gonna have classes throughout Christmas Eve and New Year's Eve, so please be here if you can. Um, and we'll finish with Meta as we always do.
So again, find your relaxed meditation posture. Gently close your eyes, gently close your mouth, and just take a moment to become mindful of your in-breath and your out-breath. And these are the Buddha's words on metta from the Karaniya Metta Sutta. This is what should be done by one who is skilled in goodness and who knows the path of peace. Let them be able and upright, straightforward and gentle in speech, humble and not conceited, contented and easily satisfied, unburdened with duties and frugal in their ways, peaceful and calm and wise and skillful, not proud or demanding in nature. Let them not do the slightest thing that the wise would later reprove. Wishing in gladness and in safety, may all beings be at ease. Whatever living beings there may be, whether they are weak or strong, omitting none, the great or the mighty, medium, short or small, the seen and the unseen, those living near and far away, those born and to be born, may all beings be at ease. Let none deceive another or despise any being in any state. Let none through anger or ill will wish harm upon another. Even as a mother protects with her life, her child, her only child, so with a boundless heart should one cherish all living beings. Radiating kindness over the entire world, spreading upwards to the skies and downwards to the depths, outwards and unbounded, freed from hatred and ill will. Whether standing or walking, seated or lying down, free from drowsiness, one should sustain this recollection. This is said to be the sublime abiding. By not holding to fixed views, the pure-hearted one, having clarity of vision, being freed from all sense desires, is not born again into this world. I think that was my quickest reading of the Metta Sutta. <laughs> Peace, everyone. Thanks for a great class. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you all for joining online. See you, Dathan, Dathane, and Thad. Thank you.